Well, most Australians are now travelling overseas more than ever before. Whereas once overseas travel was regarded as a relatively rare occurrence, the, the privilege perhaps of a select few, now it's commonplace. <coughs> As people regularly fly out of this nation on holidays or, or business trips or simply to visit friends and family overseas. In fact, to get some idea of how popular overseas travel has become, you only need to look at some of the data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. In 1966, about half a million overseas trips were taken by Australians in that year, half a million. By 2016, 50 years later, though the population of the country had doubled, the total number of overseas trips taken by Australians in that year had actually increased 20-fold to 10 million. Clearly, overseas journeys have become very popular and along with that increase in popularity has come an increase in confidence Many people have become very well versed in all that needs to be done to travel well while overseas. They know how to prepare for the journey. They know the do's and don'ts. They've learnt the tips and tricks while travelling in various countries overseas. They've learnt how to travel with confidence. Well, as we come to today's passage in the Song of Solomon, we see that the bride herself is also travelling. And as we'll see, her journey serves as a picture of the journey that we Christians are on as well. We are on our way to heaven. We are, we are on our way to glory. Or to use the language of Pilgrim's Progress, we are on our way from the city of destruction to the celestial city. But the question I want us to think about as we come to this passage this morning is this one. How is your own journey going? Are you travelling well? Are you travelling with confidence? Because the passage of the, of the bride that's described here in Song of Solomon chapter 8 provides us with what we might say are some great travel tips. And they are tips that will help us to travel with confidence to the celestial city. And so our focus this morning is on Song of Solomon chapter 8 and we're going to be looking at verses 5 to 7 this morning and so I'd invite you, if you haven't already, to turn with me now as I read this portion of God's Word, Song of Solomon chapter 8, verses 5 to 7. Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? I awakened you under the apple tree. There your mother brought you forth. There she who bore you brought you forth. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. The title end of this morning's sermon is simply Travelling with Confidence. <laughs> Travelling with confidence, and from the bride's own example in this passage, we see three things that are needful, three things that are necessary for us if we are to make our way to heaven with a measure of certainty and confidence. Firstly, we'll see the need of a travel companion. That's there in verse 5a. Secondly, we'll see the, the necessity of travel reminders. We'll see that in verse 5b. And thirdly and finally, we'll see the need of travel assurance. Not travel insurance, travel assurance. So let's look at the first point then, a travel companion. As we look at verse 5, we notice that the bride, as I said, is clearly travelling, isn't she? Verse 5, who is this coming up from the wilderness? 
leaning upon her beloved. Now the words are spoken here by the daughters of Jerusalem, a symbol as we've seen before of, of other professing Christians. And they see quite clearly that the bride is on a journey. She has come up out of the wilderness with someone by her side. She has a travelling companion. Her husband, her beloved, is with her. And here we see a very vivid and a very wonderful picture of our own redemption and journey through this world. We too have come up out of the wilderness, out of the wilderness of sin and of rebellion and of hostility towards God. And we too have come with a travelling companion. Our precious husband, the Lord Jesus himself, has graciously led us out of bondage to sin and bondage to wickedness. And he is now by our side every step of the way as we journey from salvation to glory. It's a wonderful reminder, friends, of that simple, that simple and yet glorious truth that we never travel alone while we are in this world. Yes, this world is not our home. Yes, we are just passing through. But we are not in that fearful situation which many travellers find themselves in while they are overseas, of being all alone and left to fend for themselves in a foreign country. Now, our Lord doesn't leave us as orphans. He is always by our side. No matter what the circumstances of our life may be, no matter what hardships or difficulties we may face, indeed, he has faithfully pledged to accompany us on every stage of our journey to heaven. Brethren, you know his promises. I am with you always, he said to his disciples, even to the very end of the age. Or again in Hebrews 13, verse 5, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. They are emphatic no's, I will never do such a thing. Now, brethren, I know (laughs) that this is a very basic truth. I mean, this is Christian living 101. But in our weakness and in our unbelief, we are so prone to forget it at times, especially during seasons in our life of great uncertainty or fear or confusion. And we fail to do what the bride herself does with her travelling companion. Look at her posture in verse 5 again. Verse 5, who is this coming up from the wilderness? What is she doing? She is leaning on her beloved. She is leaning on her husband as he is bringing her out of the wilderness. And the picture here is of the bride clinging to her husband's arm, holding on to his elbow, resting upon him as they travel together. It's a wonderful symbol of the believer resting in utter dependence upon the Lord Jesus as they travel together throughout this world. You know the old saying, that a picture is worth a thousand words. And that is certainly true for the image that is here before us in verse 5. I mean, just stop and think for a moment about how much biblical truth is portrayed for us in this one simple picture of the bride leaning upon her husband as they come up out of the wilderness together. Think, for example, about what it says concerning the nature of the Christian life. Being a Christian is not, as so many seem to think today, about a one-off decision made in the past to trust in the Lord Jesus. It's actually... A lifetime of continually resting upon him as we travel through this world on the way to heaven. The Christian life is indeed a life of faith, not a one-off decision made in the past. And the picture reminds us also that this way is very difficult. It's not easy even for the Lord's beloved bride to walk faithfully through this world. As we saw even in the consecutive reading this morning, this world is a dangerous place because of its many seductive temptations. It contains many things that would allure us and and tempt us and draw us away and hinder us from reaching our final destination. And so the bride needs the help of her beloved if she's going to make it through to the end. She needs his support. 
She needs him to sustain her and uphold her as they undertake this journey together. And it all points, doesn't it? Not just to the difficult nature of the Christian walk, but to the very nature of the bride herself. She is weak and insufficient of herself to make the journey by herself. No believer can make it through this world on their own. No believer can make their progress on the way to heaven without constantly relying upon the Lord Jesus. Jesus' words in John 15 are are certainly true and are certainly pictured here. Apart from me, you can do nothing. As I said, that, that truth is vividly portrayed in this picture of the bride leaning on her husband. But lest we despair at our own weakness, this picture also points us to the very nature of Christ himself. It shows him as one who is fully able and fully competent to support his beloved bride. He is a strong husband. He is a reliable guide. His arm is mighty and powerful to protect her and help her and his grip on her will always be stronger than her grip on him. Indeed, you can almost imagine the Lord Jesus as you picture this scene in your mind's eye, turning to his bride and saying to her as he did to his people back in Isaiah 41 verse 10. Well, maybe we can turn to there. Look at Isaiah 41 verse 10 and see what the Lord says to his people. Isaiah 41 verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Brethren, what promises we have been given. What encouragement we have then to do the very thing that we see the bride doing here. To rest in faith upon the Lord Jesus in every circumstance, in every facet, in every aspect of our journey through this life. He is our all sufficient saviour that we can rely upon. (coughs) And so friend, is your way presently fraught with much danger? Then lean on him to protect you. Is your way presently filled with much sorrow and grief, then lean on him to be your true comfort. Is your journey presently filled with hard and burdensome trials? Then rely upon him to uphold you and sustain you in the midst of them. Are you presently uncertain and unsure about which way to choose next? then look to him to be your faithful guide. Are you presently in great need? Then look to him and lean on him to supply you with what you lack. Remember, child of God, that you never travel alone through this world. You have a faithful traveling companion and he is not just there for for company along the way. But he is there because you constantly need him. You need him as you walk through this world on the way to heaven. So brethren, seek to do exactly as the bride does. To rest firmly upon him. Prove for yourself the truthfulness of his promise in Deuteronomy 33, 27. The eternal God is a resting place, a dwelling place, a place of refuge, as it were. What does that verse go on to say? And underneath are the everlasting arms. Rely upon him in faith with confidence for every need that you have. You will only travel with confidence through this world as you rest wholeheartedly upon the Lord Jesus each and every step of the way.
You might say, well, that's an easy thing to do in principle. But it's much harder to do in practice. It's easy to talk about the need to constantly trust the Lord Jesus, but in reality, that's a difficult thing to actually do. And I'm sure that, that that would be the testimony of every true child of God. Throughout our lives, our faith in him goes through its ups and downs. There are times in our life when, when it seems to us almost unshakable. And we are conscious that we really are walking by faith and not by sight. And yet there are other times when we just do not seem to trust him much at all. Perhaps it's because we've become so self-confident in our ability to walk the pilgrim way that we neglect to rely upon him as our saviour and as our companion. Or perhaps in the midst of difficult circumstances in life, we are plagued with many doubts about the Lord Jesus and his willingness to help us. Our trust in him wavers throughout the course of our life. How then can we cultivate this kind of reliance that we see pictured here by the bride? Well, that brings us to the second part of our sermon this morning. If we are to travel with confidence through this wicked world, we not only need a faithful travelling companion, we also need travel reminders. And we find this, I believe, in the second part of verse 5. But before we look at the rest of this verse, I should say, and I say it with a smile, that this is a notoriously difficult passage to understand. In fact, one commentator suggested that this is one of the most difficult and obscure passages of the whole book of Song of Solomon. Now that's saying something. And the reason for that is that the words that are spoken at the end of verse 5 are actually the words of the bride herself. The New King James assigns those words to, to an unknown relative, but it's clear in the original language that here the bride is speaking, and she's speaking to her husband. And what she says to him is very strange, especially when we consider that this is symbolic of a believer speaking to Christ himself. Look at what she says to him as she leans upon his arm. I awakened you, she says, under the apple tree. There your mother brought you forth. There she who bore you brought you forth. You now we've seen some of, the, of this imagery before in earlier parts of the book of Song of Solomon. Back in chapter 2 verse 3 we saw what is pictured by the apple tree. It's a picture of the Lord Jesus himself. Chapter 2, verse 3 says, Like an apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down in his shade with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. And so if we compare Scripture with Scripture, we find that the apple tree is clearly a picture of the Lord Jesus himself, and particularly of the refreshment and of the delight and comfort and protection that he provides for the bride as she rests in his shade. Well, then what about the mother in verse 5? Who is the bride speaking about when she speaks of her husband's mother? Well, again, as we've seen previously, the groom and the bride, in some manner, share the same mother. Remember, the groom calls her many times in this book, my sister, my spouse. And back in chapter 3, verse 11, we were told that on the groom's wedding day, his mother would place a great crown upon his head. And it all served as a picture for us of that great future day when the church herself crowns Christ by her unchanging, loyal obedience and submission to him. The mother mentioned here, I think, is a symbol, as it is elsewhere in the song, of the company of, of the redeemed, of the entire church of God. So brethren, keep those two symbols in mind. Christ as the apple tree and the mother as the church of God as we return now to the second half of verse 5. So far we've only observed the couple from a distance. 
with the bride leaning on her beloved. But now we draw closer and we listen in, as it were, on words that are passing between the two of them on what the bride herself is saying to her beloved as she rests on him. What does she say? First of all, she says, I awakened you under the apple tree. And what's she doing here? Well, at the very least, she's recalling something that has happened in the past. We can say that at the very least, can't we? She's looking back to something that occurred earlier on in their relationship. And she is, in effect, asking her groom to remember it as well. Do you recall, she says in effect to him, that time when I awakened you under the apple tree? That word awaken can certainly mean to awaken from sleep, but it can also carry the idea of of rousing someone to action, of making them alert, of stirring them up for a particular purpose. And it's a picture, friends, I think of those times when we prevail with our Lord in secret prayer. It's those times when in his very presence, under the shade of the apple tree, as it were, we earnestly seek the Lord Jesus in in prayer, imploring him to hear our cries, beseeching him to answer our prayers. Those times when we cry out, as it were, awake, O Lord, and answer me. And we find, (laughs) to our delight and often to our surprise, that he answers us. In, fa- in ways far more wonderful than we ever expected or anticipated. You see, the bride here is remembering as she leans upon her husband those times in the past when she has awakened her groom. And such times for a, for a believer and not just fond and sweet memories of what our God has done for us in the past, but they serve as a wonderful encouragement and boost for our present faith. They assure us of what he is able to do for us even now in our Christian life, based on his faithfulness to us in the past. And that's why, friends, I've entitled this section of this morning's sermon, Travel Reminders. If we would travel with confidence through this wicked world, we need to be in the habit of remembering our Lord's good dealings with us. And particularly those special times in the history of our own personal life when he has answered our prayers. Such reminders are an excellent means of boosting a flagging faith. Such memories will incline our hearts to want to lean on the Lord Jesus even more, to want to rest on him even more. Friends, we need these frequent travel reminders. Indeed, this is something that we see God's people doing frequently throughout the Scriptures. Looking back and recalling what God has done for them in the past in response to their own cries for help, O Lord, awake and hear me and answer. Psalm 138, verse 1, In the day when I cried out, you answered me. You made me bold with strength in my soul. Or again, Psalm 18, verse 6. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. And he heard my voice from his temple and my cry came before his ears, before him, even to his ears. Or the words of David in Psalm 34. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Dear believer, do you feel at this moment in your Christian life that your trust in the Lord is not what it should be? Are you struggling with doubts? Are you battling with unbelief? Are you not leaning upon your faithful travel companion as you know you ought to? then resolve even today to do what the psalmist did in Psalm 77 when he says in verse 11, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. 
Cast your mind back over the course of your Christian life and deliberately remember how Christ has awakened to your cries for help in the past. Recall specific instances when he has wonderfully assured you and answered your prayers and it will be a means that he blesses to revive your love and increase your faith in him even now. And friend, if you are struggling to recall such times, then cast the net wider. Recall how the church of God herself has so travailed and prevailed with God in prayer. And this is what I think is a picture for us when the bride goes on to say to her groom at the end of verse 5, there your mother brought you forth. There she who bore you brought you forth. Those words there, bring forth, here carry the idea of wrestling, of writhing, of twisting. And yes, particularly in the context of a woman giving birth to a child, but again, it also serves as a a very vivid picture of the way that believers often wrestle with God in prayer until the answer comes. Biblical history is littered with such examples where God's people earnestly cry out to him and they bring down rich blessings from heaven in response to their prayers. Think of how Jacob wrestled with God at Penuel and obtained the blessing that he was seeking. Remember how the children of Israel cried out to their God while they were slaves in Egypt and he delivered them. Or what about King Hezekiah in in the face of a threatening letter from the enemies of Israel and he cries out to God for deliverance and God miraculously answers. Well, remember how even the church of uh, uh, the early church was praying while Peter was in prison and all of a sudden Peter appears at the front door. Well, what about countless others not just in biblical history but throughout church history? Read the biographies of Christian men and women and see how they prevailed with God and were heard. Brethren we need as often as possible to remember such real life examples We need to recollect how our Saviour has wonderfully helped those travellers who have gone before because in so doing, it reminds us that the same Saviour they walked with through this world, the same Saviour they rested upon, is the very same Saviour that we walk with and the very same Saviour that we can rest upon. Such travel reminders are a wonderful means to stir up and increase our own faith that we might lean more securely on our beloved groom and travel with confidence to the celestial city. As we come to the third part of our sermon this morning, it's worth remembering again that the, the bride here is speaking to her groom. She has recounted her dealings with him in the past and how she awakened him to respond to her prayers. And now that remembrance of past answers emboldens her to make a request for the present time. And we find it now in the first part of verse 6. Look at what she says. Again, look at what she says as she leans upon him. She says, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. In ancient times, seals or medallions or pendants or the like would be worn around a person's neck, near their heart or or upon their arm. And inscribed upon them would be the name of one's beloved. Such things served as as visible tokens or signs, not only that a person was dearly loved by another, but but that they belonged to another. And so the bride here is expressing an earnest desire that she might be near to her beloved's heart in all his desires, in all his loves, in all his affections. And not only that, she also desires that she be near to his arm as well. She wants to be reassured that her beloved groom will always be ready to act with might and power on her behalf. She wants some visible token that she belongs to him and is dear to him and won't be forgotten by him. In other words, 
This is a, an earnest request for assurance. And that is what I've entitled this third section this morning, Travel Assurance, not insurance, <laughs> assurance. If we would walk well in this world, if we would travel with confidence, then we need to be assured of our Saviour's love for us personally. We need a measure of assurance. Few things will prove such a help on our way to heaven than an inner confidence, a settled conviction that I, even I personally, am loved and cherished by the Lord Jesus. And this is what the bride is eagerly asking for when she says, set me as a seal upon your heart and upon your arm. Cause me to know, let me have some token of assurance that I am loved by you. But that raises a question. Why would the bride make such a request? Is she fearful that the groom will perhaps stop loving her? Is she concerned that his love for her is fickle? Is she worried that he might abandon her at some point in the future? Does she have doubts about the true nature of her husband's love? Well, no, I don't think it's any of those things. In fact, I think it's quite the opposite. The reason she longs for such an assurance of his love is pre precisely because she knows what his love is really like. And we see that in the rest of verses 6 and 7. She actually goes on to describe the very nature of her husband's love. She knows what his love is like. His love to her is the embodiment of what real love actually is. Look again at what she says in verses 6 to 7. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. Why? For love is as strong as death. Jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. Again, it seems like strange language, but as we look at it more closely, we see her describing four aspects of her husband's love. Firstly, she describes the strength of his love. His love is as strong as death. Just as physical death has a mighty hold upon every human being, no one can escape it. So the love of Christ for his people is a mighty and strong love. It can never be overcome. It can never be resisted. It can never be conquered. His loving grip upon his people is so strong that no enemy is ever able to snatch us out of his hands. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. His love is a strong love. And secondly, she describes his love as a jealous love. Verse 6 again, jealousy is as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Now, when we hear the word jealousy, we often think of it only in negative terms, in, in terms of, of envy. But remember, the scripture sometimes speaks of jealousy in a positive sense. Indeed, God himself declares in Exodus 20, I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. Jealousy, when rightly understood, is a divine attribute. And it's that attribute of being righteously dedicated and zealous for the honour of the one who loved. And here, the bride describes such jealous love as cruel. It is as cruel as the grave, she, she says. Again, we need to understand this word rightly. The word cruel here carries with it the sense of that which is persistent, that which is unyielding. And just as the grave is unyielding, yeah, the grave never gives up its prey. So too, the Lord Jesus will never give his people up either. He will never give them over to another. His love is an intensely loyal and devoted and zealous love. It is a jealous love. 
And thirdly, she speaks of his love as an unquenchable love. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. The Lord's love for his people is so intense that nothing, absolutely nothing can extinguish the love that Christ has for his people. No circumstance from without, no flood of sins that we might commit will ever cause the groom to cease loving his dearly beloved bride. His love is an unquenchable love. And that leads her fourthly and finally to speak of the preciousness of her husband's love. Verse 7, if a man, she says, would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. So valuable and precious is the nature of true love, the love which Christ has for his people, than even to think of purchasing it with all of one's wealth would still vastly and wickedly underestimate its true worth. Anyone who would do so would rightly be despised. Nothing is more precious. Nothing is to be more treasured than the love of the groom for his beloved bride. And so, friends, we can see, I trust, as we study these verses, that the bride herself really does know the nature of her husband's love. She knows his love is a strong love, a jealous, unquenchable and precious love. It's not as though she has any doubts about what his love is like. And so when she looks to him for assurance and entreats him to set her as a seal upon his heart, she does it not because she's looking for some confirmation that her groom loves in this way, but she's doing it because she wants to be assured that her groom personally loves her in this way. That his love for her is strong. That his love for her is jealous. That his love for her is unquenchable. That his love for her is precious. She is craving a personal assurance of her husband's love for her. And it pictures, friends, the very thing that almost every genuine believer experiences at some time or other in their Christian walk. Actually, in all honesty, it's something that we experience many times. That experience of lacking real assurance that Christ loves and cares for me personally. It's not that we've suddenly turned from the faith. It's not as though we we even doubt or deny what he says in the scriptures. We still believe he is who he says he is. We still believe that his word is true and that his promises are true. Like the bride in this picture, we are still in effect leaning upon him. Knowing that his love for his people is indeed strong and loyal and unquenchable and precious. But providential circumstances or hard and difficult times can leave us often wondering, Lord, do you personally love me in this way? We lack any real assurance of Christ's love for us. And sadly, isn't it? Isn't it the case that it's often at those times when we feel we need it most desperately? Brethren, is that not true? Surely if you've been a believer for any length of time, you've experienced these things. In fact, perhaps this is precisely the kind of circumstances you find yourself in right now this morning, sitting here among the Lord's people. Struggling with a lack of real assurance that the Lord loves you. And friends, I would urge you to do the very thing that we see the bride doing here in verse 6. Earnestly entreat your Lord. Earnestly entreat your Lord for the assurance that you are longing for. Plead with him that he would give you fresh tokens of his love for you. That you are sealed upon his heart. 
that you are sealed upon his arm. Cry out to him for that certainty that he loves you with a strong and unquenchable love and that he will act with might and power on your behalf. Plead with him for such an assurance of his love for you. Brethren, again, such assurance is a needful thing if we would travel with confidence out from this wilderness and into the celestial city. See, to know in a general sense that Christ loves his people is one thing. But to have the assurance that I personally am loved by him is quite another thing altogether. And that sense of certainty will help make our journey on the road to heaven a much sweeter trip. So let us entreat him, implore him, that he would supply us with travel assurance. Friends, as we conclude our time in the word of God this morning, I come back to the question that I asked you to consider at the start of the sermon. How is your own journey to the heavenly city progressing? Are you travelling well? Brethren, if we would travel with confidence to our destination, we must remember the travel tips that are pictured by the bride here in the Song of Solomon, chapter 8. We do indeed have a faithful travel companion, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus, whom we must constantly lean upon throughout our entire journey. We have many travel reminders, circumstances or occasions that we can look back to and recall how our Lord has helped us in the past, that we might increase our faith and rest upon him more securely in the present. And we must earnestly seek him for travel assurance, that inward certainty that I am his and he is mine, that he personally loves me with a strong and jealous and unquenchable love that is more precious than anything else in this world. May our gracious Saviour, and our wonderful companion help each of us to travel well to travel with confidence resting more fully upon him to lead us and guide us and bring us safely out of this wilderness into the celestial city let's pray Now, Lord, we bless you again for your word. And we bless you again as we prayed even at the start of the sermon this morning for its relevance for your people even today. Lord, we ask that you would imprint these truths upon our heart. And that especially, Lord, you would grant to us that real measure and sense of assurance that you do indeed love us, that you are indeed with us, and that your mighty arm is powerful and willing to help us as we walk this pilgrim way until the very day when we see you face to face in glory. Help us, we pray. In your name we ask. Amen.